Sally and, and the guys from Leukemia and Blood Cancer asked me to speak today about graft versus host disease. Um, it's a massive topic and it's a complex topic and um, I, we're not going to be able to cover all aspects of it today in any way, shape or form. Um, so what I thought I'd do is just give you a bit of a, a, an overview uh, of it and hopefully have some time uh, at the end for questions and comments and discussions. Um, I am no expert at graft versus host disease. I know a little bit about it. And if you've got curly questions uh, that I can't answer today, then I'm really happy to go away and um, find the answers and get back in touch with you if you've got a uh, anything that you particularly want to know. So what is um, graft versus host disease, or GVHD as I'm going to call it during the talk? Um, it's a complication of allogeneic stem cell transplant. Um, so that is when you have a transplant from somebody else other than yourself. And it is potentially serious and may be life-threatening. And it certainly has a significant impact on your quality of life and the quali quality of life of those around you. During an allogeneic stem cell transplant, a patient receives stem cells from a donor. The donated cells contain T cells, which are a type of white cell or immune cell um, that um, help to protect the body by um, recognizing foreign invaders like um, viruses and bacteria and destroying them. T cells um, also recognize uh, leukemia cells and kill them, and that's how allogeneic stem cell transplant works. However, donor cells, or the graft, um, may also attack the patient's healthy and um, normal organs, um, the host, um, which can impair those organs and may cause them to fail. So this is graft versus host disease. The new stem cells, the graft, attacking the host or the recipient. So 20 to 60% of um, allogeneic transplant recipients will get some form of graft versus host disease. The onset is usually after the donor cells have engrafted. So when you get your transplant, it takes about two to three weeks for those cells to start growing. And usually graft versus host disease will occur after that time. Uh, very rarely it can occur beforehand, but it's usually after the cells have started growing. It does vary in severity, so it may be mild, may be moderate, it may be severe. And in severe cases, uncontrolled graft versus host disease may be fatal. And it affects various organs in the body. There are two kind of main types of graft versus host disease, if you like. So acute graft versus host disease, um, which mainly affects the skin, liver and gut, and this occurs early on after the transplant. Chronic graft versus host disease, um, which as its name suggests, can be a long-term complication and can affect many organ systems in our body. And then there is a, an overlap syndrome where there is a mixture of acute symptoms and chronic symptoms as well. So I'm going to kind of walk through a, a, acute graft versus host disease first and then focus on um, chronic graft versus host disease. So as I said, acute graft versus host disease usually occurs in the first three months after the transplant. Um, occasionally and in circum certain circumstances it may occur later, but it's most commonly seen in that first three months. Around about 30 to 70 percent of recipients will get some form of um, acute graft versus host disease. <coughs> and the organ systems that acute GVH usually affect is the skin, the gut and the liver. There are some risk factors for getting acute graft versus host disease. So when we tissue type you and your donor, if there's a mismatch in the tissue typing, then that can mean you've got, you're at more risk of getting GVH or if you have an unrelated stem cell donor. If you as a patient are a bit older and or your donor is older, then that, um, you're more likely to get some acute GVH. 
if you have a female donor going into a male recipient, the intensity of the conditioning regime or that chemotherapy and radiotherapy that we give you prior to the stem cells going in um, can um, impact on acute graft versus host disease. So if you have a very high um, myeloablative transplant with high doses of chemotherapy and radiotherapy, there's much more inflammation of your gut and things, and so you're more likely to get some acute graft versus host disease. And then um, we have a situation of a donor lymphocyte infusion. So sometimes after the transplant, if we see that your um, in your blood, blood test that the, the number of donor cells is falling, we can give you an infusion of the donor immune cells, and these are called donor lymphocytes. And that's to try and stimulate those um, stem cells to, to get active again, and, and um, a donor lymphocyte infusion can um, cause you to have some graft versus host disease. So prevention of, graft, uh, of acute graft versus host disease, ideally we don't want you to have any of this. So we, um, we want to give you some medicines and things to, to prevent graft versus host disease. And so um, our most common immune suppressing medicines that we use to prevent acute GVHD are cyclosporin and methotrexate, and then a couple of others that we use fairly regularly are tacrolimus and mycophenolate. It's really important that you take the immune suppressing drugs as prescribed by your haematologist. If you miss doses or don't take quite as much as they um, prescribe, then you're leaving yourself open for getting acute GVH. For patients that have a, a haploidentical stem cell transplant or a half matched transplant, then um, having a, a cyclophosphamide chemotherapy. Uh, on days three and four after the transplant is one of the most important things that we can do to prevent graft versus host disease in the half match transplant situation. One of the most important things that you can do is actually protect yourself from the sun. So a sun, the sun in New Zealand is a bad guy anyway for melanoma, but if you've had a transplant, it can um, uh, cause skin graft versus host disease. Um, so you need to slip, slop, slap and wrap and stay out of the, the heat of the sun. So let's look at, um, at acute skin graft versus host disease. Um, so skin uh, usually presents as a, as a rash, which can be anywhere on the body, but often it can start on the palms of the hands and soles of the feet. And you can see this picture here um, has uh, a rash on the palms of the hands. Now it's not, it's, it's not very commonplace to get rashes on the palms. You get them on the back of the hands, but not on the palms. So this is something that is relatively distinctive. It can be itchy or painful or both at the same time and it can spread to your whole body and in severe cases it may cause blistering of your skin and loss of the skin just like um, if you're a burns patient. Here's a picture of somebody's back. It's a funny looking back actually, but um, it, you can see that kind of red inflamed rash which is acute graft versus host disease. So for treatment of acute GVH, um, so steroids. So steroids are the first line of uh, treatment for um, all acute graft versus host disease as you'll see going through the slides. Um, for skin GVH, if we've got just a, a very mild skin rash, it may be that we can just use some topical steroid cream. Um, but for significant, more significant rashes or um, greater involvement, um, then systemic steroids, either tablet form in the form of prednisone or through your drip. We can use something called PUVA, which is uh, the use of an ultraviolet A light um, treatment. It's not um, something that we do very often, but it is a possibility. Supportive care is really important with um, skin GVH, so um, it's important to keep your skin moisturised, to keep your skin clean, um, apply topical steroids if prescribed by your haematologist, and once again, stay out of the sun. 
Acute graft versus host disease involving, involving the liver is often invisible as it's often only picked up on the blood tests that we do um, with regularity, as you know. Um, it's characterised by um, increased liver enzymes and in, in severe cases there may be yellowing of the skin or the whites of the eyes, um, which you would know as jaundice or abdominal pain, but mostly it's fairly invisible and is just detected by the, by the treating team um, on your blood tests. If you do have some acute liver graft versus host disease, then once again the first line of treatment is steroids. So prednisone or, um, or methylprednisolone through your drip. Sometimes we need to add other immune suppressing medicines. Um, we often nowadays will start people on this curly drug called ursodeoxycholic acid. And what that is is a secondary bile um, acid which helps to improve those liver enzymes that are abnormal. And we also try and minimise the use of um, liver toxic drugs. And the third system that acute graft versus host disease affects is the gut. So this normally presents as diarrhoea. It can be green and watery. It's called a secretory diarrhoea. So what that means is that your gut is secreting lots of fluid and the di diarrhoea continues despite the gut being rested if we stop you eating. Whereas if you have a bug of some description and you stop eating, your diarrhoea will slow down, whereas graft versus host disease, that doesn't happen. And the diarrhoea may wake you at night. It can also cause significant abdominal cramping and pain. Other symptoms associated with acute gut GVH include nausea and anorexia, where you go off your food, and weight loss. Acute gut GVH is slow to settle. It takes a long time before those immune suppressing medicines that we give you kick in and you may need to be on treatment for some weeks before we can start to wean those off. And during that time, because your gut is not absorbing things, you may need to be in hospital and may, may need to have um, supportive feeding um, to prevent malnutrition. So once again, for the treatment of acute GVH, the first line is steroids. If um, you don't have too much diarrhoea and you're absorbing things okay, we can give you some oral prednisone, but otherwise we need to give you your steroids through a drip. And we can also use a special medicine called budesonide, which is a steroid pill that you can swallow, but the steroid just bathes your gut and is not absorbed into your bloodstream. We oftentimes add in other um, immune suppressing medicines as well, like mycophenolate. Supportive care measures are really important with gut graft versus host disease because a lot of the time you're not able to, um, to absorb medicines or um, nutrients and so supplemental feeding is really important and our dietitian is, is particularly helpful in this situation. Um, you may need high calorie, high, fo high protein food supplements, you may need a lactose free diet, or if you have bad gut GVH, you might need to be fed through your drip using total parenteral nutrition. We often will completely rest your gut and um, you may need to be on some anti-diarrhea medicines as well. So, just to summarise acute graft versus host disease, it usually occurs in the first three months after the transplant and the three main organ systems that it involves is the skin, the gut and the liver. It may be mild, not need any treatment, it may be moderate, may be severe and in rare cases it may be um, fatal. First line of treatment is steroids, whether it's a tablet or through your drip or some topical treat topical creams. Okay, so chronic graft versus host disease is the most common late complication after an allogeneic stem cell transplant. It most commonly occurs around six months after the transplant, but around 10% of people can be diagnosed beyond a year after transplant, and some people are diagnosed many years after transplant. It can often be seen when the doctors are trying to wean down your immune suppression therapy. So you might get a flare of graft versus host disease. And it has a very different clinical picture to acute graft versus host disease. It affects many parts of your body 
and it has features that are similar to autoimmune diseases, whereas acute graft-versus-host disease is more of an inflammatory picture. So chronic graft-versus-host disease can occur in 20 to 70 percent of patients surviving more than 100 days after transplant. It is associated with decreased quality of life for you and the people around you, and also can be a cause of death after transplant. So risk factors for chronic graft-versus-host disease is if you've had acute graft-versus-host disease in that first three months after your transplant, if you've had an unrelated donor transplant, if the stem cells that we've collected from your donor have been collected from the peripheral blood rather than the bone marrow, so you can get more graft, chronic graft-versus-host disease. And that's because there are more T cells, which are the donor's immune cells, collected in the peripheral blood rather than from the bone marrow. If you have a female donor going into a male recipient, and if you have a female donor that's had more than one pregnancy, um, because that female donor has been exposed to other immune systems through her pregnancies, um, her um, immune system is a little bit more active. So I'm going to walk through some of the uh, organ systems that are affected by chronic graft-versus-host disease. And so let's look at skin first. Um, it's the most common organ to be involved. And signs include rashes, but not those red inflammatory rashes that we saw with acute graft-versus-host disease. You may get a change in skin colour. You may get a change in skin texture. So your skin can become hard and inflexible, may become shiny, it may become thick. You may get some itching, burning or tightness of the skin. And you may get some new swelling in the hands, arms, feet or legs. And this picture here is a, is a lady with chronic skin graft and you can see these dark patches and the skin are, are under those dark patches is probably quite thick and um, not as supple as, uh, as, the rest of, uh, as the rest of her skin. It may also affect your nails, hair and sweat glands and so you can see these nails up here they may be brittle or ridged or split easily. You may lose your fingernails or toenails. You might get some <laughs> you might get some hair thinning or a change in your hair texture um, or hair loss. It may also affect your sweat glands and if that happens then you may not be able to sweat and so being in hot um, climates might be difficult for you because the sweating helps us to control our body temperature. Mm. So treatment of chronic skin GVH once again involves immune suppression. So there's a theme going through here. Um, so oral or topical immune suppressing medicines and once again often we use steroids. Using moisturising creams um, with a water soluble base is really, um, uh, we encourage and we encourage you to do that after your bath or shower because it's absorbed into your skin better when it's slightly damp. We suggest you use emollient creams at night, so these are fat or oil based creams and um, you want to keep them close to your skin, so wear old clothes, gloves or socks or leggings to, to keep that cream in contact with your skin to help moisturise it. It's not very sexy though, sadly. Avoid the sun, once again, and um, avoid using perfumed soaps and creams and harsh laundry detergents because that can irritate your skin and also avoid scrubbing, scrubbing your skin. So oral or mouth graft versus host disease is another common site for, um, for GVH. So the signs of this include increased mouth sensitivity or pain, um, having a very dry mouth, which is like mine right now, um, painful ulcers. You may, <laughs> you may see white lacy cobwebs or lacy patches, uh, white patches on the inner aspects of your cheeks and you might have purplish or reddish areas on the lips or inner cheeks. And you can see this picture on the left here, you've got this kind of white lacy stuff going on that's very, um, very uh, consistent with chron oral chronic graft versus host disease. 
And this one on the right here, you can see ulceration on the inside of the lip there, which can be very painful. So treatment for oral graft versus host disease, once again, is immune suppression, um, usually topical creams or rinses or sprays to try and um, dampen down that, that um, inflammation. But it's really important that you take good care of your mouth. Okay, so we encourage you to see your dentist regularly or if you're involved with a hospital dentist to see them regularly. It's important to use fluoride gels and rinses to pre prevent tooth decay. If you have mouth dryness as a feature of your graft versus host disease, then you're not producing much saliva and saliva protects your teeth from dental caries. So using fluoride gels and rinses is important to prevent tooth decay. It's important that you brush and you fl floss your teeth regularly and um, use artificial um, salivas or rinsing your mouth often with water to help with um, dryness. If you do have a dry mouth, sometimes chewing sugarless gum to stimulate saliva production helps. And if you do have a dry mouth, um, then sipping water during meals helps um, with your chewing and swallowing of your food. Saliva helps moisten your food, um, which means you can chew and swallow it a little bit easier. So it's uh, uh, important to uh, avoid a few things if you can. So drinks with caffeine, um, and tobacco and alcohol, they dry out your mouth. And if you don't have much in the way of saliva production, then um, that's um, not going to help. If you have a painful mouth, then spicy or salty foods are going to cause you extreme pain. And mouthwashes with alcohol, so a lot of over-the-counter mouthwashes do have some alcohol in it. They dry your mouth out and they may be very painful as well. So chronic eye graft versus host disease, often noticed as dry eyes with dry irritation. So the signs, as I say, are dryness, grittiness of your eyes, redness, burning and pain. Um, you may have some sensitivity to bright lights. You may have blurry vision, and this is usually in the context of um, scarring of your cornea. And you have eyes that tire easily. And having dry, sore eyes can also make you feel really fatigued. So treatment of um, eye chronic GVH, um, we, you should be using um, single-use preservative-free artificial tears to keep your eyes nice and moist, and it may be that you're using those every hour during the day. At night, it's important to use lubricating ointment. When you're asleep and dreaming, your eyes move around the insides of your eyelids a lot. And if your eyelids are dry, then you're potentially grazing your cornea. So using a, a lubricating ointment at night is important. Use wraparound eyewear. So it um, helps um, keep wind and dust out of, um, of your eyes and, and the wind, you know, dries them out. So, and it helps keep moisture in. So using wraparound eyewear is important. Medical interventions that can be done. So if you have some tear production, um, then the ophthalmologist can block your tear ducts to prevent it draining away and therefore keeping moisture in your eyes. Can use some topical immune suppressing medicines can use um, serum eye drops. So the New Zealand Blood Service can make some serum eye drops for you. And there are things called scleral lenses, um, which are available in the US, um, where they have a, you have a, a, a reservoir, if you like, of fluid and some contact lenses, which helps keep your um, eyes moist. But we don't really have that option available to us. So a lung chronic graft versus host disease. So this is something that can occur um, not in the transplant world. It's called bronchiolitis obliterans. Um, but for um, people who are post-transplant, um, this is really lung graft versus host disease. And it may cause scarring in the small airways that interfere with breathing out of air. Signs may be a cough or a decreased ability to exercise but often it begins silently and people don't notice any symptoms and may just be picked up when your team do um, routine lung function testing after the transplant. Lung function testing is also done to, um, to confirm um, lung GVH 
and to monitor how it's progressing. And we can also do CT scans and chest X-rays to check. Once again, immune suppressing medicines are used to treat this and we can use inhaled steroids like the asthmatics do to help treat that and bronchodilators to help um, dilate the airways. We can use an, an allergic, anti-allergic medicine called Montelukast to help as well. What you can do is avoid smoking. That kind of makes sense. If your lungs are compromised, you don't want to be um, you, um, smoking and to try and avoid getting lung infections because if you have infection on, already, on lungs that are already a bit damaged, then <coughs> potentially you can make things worse. And a good way to help prevent that is to get the annual flu injection because um, that if you get a secondary pneumonia after catching the flu, then um, that's really not going to help. Uh, GVH also affects the whole gastrointestinal tract, so the stomach, the intestines and the esophagus or your swallowing tube. Signs of this may be a loss of appetite, um, some nausea or vomiting, you may get some tummy cramps or weight loss. If it affects your esophagus you may um, have difficulty swallowing some of your big tablets or um, choking on food um, and it can also cause some diarrhoea and bloating. Treatment for this is uh, once again immune suppressing medicines, so um, topical steroids, that non-absorbable steroid that bathes your intestine is useful in this situation, um, but we also may need to increase your immune, uh, systemic immune suppression. You may also need supportive care medicines like anti-sickness medicines and anti-diarrheal medicines. We may also need to increase your calories or pop you on a special diet to help control your gut graft versus host disease and our dietitian is really useful with helping with these. Chronic GVH can also involve the liver. Once again, like with acute, um, acute liver GVHD, it really causes symptoms and is mostly picked up on your blood test. Symptoms are usually related to bile not being cleared from your blood and that can cause you to turn yellow and severe cases, but mostly it's just um, picked up on your blood tests. Once again, immune suppressing medicines are used to treat it. Um, we try and rest your liver and give you some ursodeoxycholic acid to try and normalise your liver tests. What you can do is avoid over-the-counter medicines and homeopathic medicines and some nu nutritional supplements. So some of these um, uh, items, they can contain things that may interact with the medicines that your haematology team is giving you or else be toxic in themselves um, to the liver. So um, we're happy to let you try things but we want to know what's in them. And of course alcohol, so alcohol is processed through your liver and um, avoiding alcohol is going to be of huge benefit to your liver. GVH can also affect our genitalia, so for women it affects the vagina and vulva um, and, and symptoms of that are dryness and itching, pain, ulceration and scarring and um, sex, having sex may be uncomfortable or painful. Management of this is if you were premenopausal before your transplant then we need to make sure that you're on um, hormone replacement therapy so that you're getting the normal um, sex hormones floating around your body that you would have at your, um, as other women your age. Um, topical oestrogen creams applied to locally to the vagina at least three times a week. We encourage you to have sex, um, so it's important and we do encourage that because having sex helps keep the, um, the walls of the vagina apart but you need to use lots of lubrication. If you're not sexually active, then we encourage um, by um, using vaginal dilators to, to help with that. And we want you to see a gynaecologist regularly. And if you do have some graft versus host in that area, then once again we use um, some topical steroids. What you can do is avoid strong soaps or perfumed products because that can irritate um, the area as can wet or tight clothing. And it's important when you're going to the toilet to wipe from front to back because that um, helps prevent infection. The men don't get away scot-free either, um, so it can, if <laughs> it can uh, affect the skin on the penis and the scrotum. And signs of this include itching, scarring or pain or abnormal appearance. 
and management of this is um, topical moisturising creams or steroids. And if um, you haven't been circumcised before, sometimes you do need to have circumcision to help with this. So other um, features of chronic graft versus host disease, it may give you some muscle cramps and often um, magnesium supple supplementation may help with this. Um, some people get joint pain and stiffness, so um, engaging in um, yoga or Pilates or exercise regimes is, is, is good for that. You may see changes in your blood tests, so you might have a high or a low platelet count, and if you have a low platelet count, that can freak you out because you think your disease has come back. Um, you may have more um, eosinophils, which are a kind of white cell. It may cause you to be a little bit anemic, which is a drop in your red cells, and it may also cause you to be a little bit neutropenic. One of the other features of um, chronic graft versus host disease is infection, and it may be as a, as a result of the graft versus host disease itself, but more likely it's because we've increased the immune suppressing medicines to dampen down the graft versus host disease, and so we've therefore dampened down your immune system, so your ability to fight infection is less. Um, so infection can be um, a bit of a problem. So chronic graft versus host disease may have a sig significant impact on your quality of life and for those around you as well. It may change how you look, it may um, change your ability to be able to do some of the things that you were able to do before your transplant, it may um, cause you to have decreased energy and it may mean that you just need to reframe yourself and find a new normal which is different, a different you from the pre-transplant you. It can um, cause significant fatigue, and it can of course cause stress and anxiety and depression. It's normal to feel sad or angry or frustrated. You know, this, um, you know, this chronic graft versus host disease has really changed things for you and the way that you're, you've run your life. Um, but if you are feeling depressed most of the si time or have long periods of um, feeling sad, then it's important to get some help. So if you're diagnosed with chronic graft versus host disease, what can you do? Well, keeping healthy is really important. So you need to keep up with your well woman and well man checks through your GP and any other GP, um, screening tests that you would routinely have done with your GP. Physical exercise and activity is really important. It helps if you've got um, skin GVH, it helps keep it stretched out and supple and um, it's good for you anyway. Healthy eating and drinking enough fluids is very important um, and reducing stress and staying out of the sun again. So um, any concerns, so if you think you may have some signs of graft of gra versus host disease then get in touch with your haematology team, whether it's one of your doctors or one of your transplant nurses um, and, and it's, you know, do do it, it's best to get on with treatment early if, if that's what it really is. But if also, if you have any questions or concerns, just once again get in touch with them. No question is a silly question, and we're really happy for you to, to ring us or email us. We're not quite up to Twitter yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, summary of chronic graft versus host disease. So it is the most common long-term complication of allogeneic stem cell transplant. As I've said, it may affect multiple organ systems, but skin and mouth is the most common. It may have a significant impact on your quality of life and those around you. And you may need to think about your post-transplant life, not as resuming your old life, but instead of reframing yourself and creating a new life direction uh, with um, GVHD factored in. So that's all a little bit depressing, so I want to kind of finish with the silver lining, I guess. So the risk of relapse is lower in patients who have some chronic graft versus host disease. So when your new immune system attacks your tissues causing graft versus host disease, it's also attacking any cancer or leukemia cells left in your body. Now this is called the graft versus tumor effect or graft versus le leukemia effect. And it's um, one of the important reasons why allogeneic stem cell transplants work. I've put up uh, some uh, websites where you may find um, some uh, information um, about and education about 
graft versus host disease. Most of these are American um, sites, so you need to be aware of um, different ways of um, of treating um, and accessing health, the health system. But yeah, there are a few few links there for you.